and a very warm welcome to my community. I'm Sherwood Vachaski. I'm pleased that you have joined us. Our program this week is carried by a gentleman who spent 48 years in the teaching service, retiring in 2015 as senior teacher and head of the General Studies Department of the Allen School. Major Irwin Boyce is very keen about the environment and he spends a considerable amount of his time calling attention to its protection and preservation. Exactly which geographical feature we are focusing on this week, Major Boyce? Long Pond is a permanent stretch of brackish water in the northeast corner of St. Andrew, the Scotland district. It has been called by many names, an estuary lagoon, a wetland, According to the geography, all of these terms are correct. And what it is not is a river. Most people are saying that Long Pond is a river, but Long Pond is no river. A river has to come from somewhere. There's a mountain, you obviously don't have that here, as well as a spring. And it has to be going somewhere. So it flows from where it starts, which is its source, and it ends generally at the mouth. Long Pond is located to the north of Windy Hill, which is at the foothills of the Chalky Mount Mountain. It is also south of the Savannah area, and it is also east of the Allen School or Bell Plain, and it is open to the sea. It has a sandbar in front of it, which is only breached during high water tide, high sea level, when you have storms, for example, or winter, winter swells or surges, and when there is a lot of rainfall inland. It is fed by two large water courses, and notice I said water courses and not rivers, because rivers start, as I said earlier, start from somewhere and they flow somewhere else. That's to the sea, its mouth, but it does not give up its water any part of the year. And we have a problem here because during the dry season, these two water courses are not flowing. And that's the problem. It is the largest body of water after Grain Hall, and it is the largest body of water on the East Coast Road. To the southeast of the pond is a complex sand dune area, which runs from north to east. It is the largest sand dune complex in Barbados. The dunes run parallel to the sea. And therefore, they act as windbreaks or barrier to the high winds coming off the Atlantic Ocean. So they actually protect the land further inland from being um, affected by the salt and therefore devoid of their leaves or their tops. And you can see it from here that the vegetation further inland from the coast is pretty green and have all the parts intact. In order for a sand dune to form, there must be three ingredients. There must be a constant flow of wind, there must be an obstacle, and there must be uh, something preventing it from being destroyed. So three things should be there. And once those three things are in place, then you have a sand dune. You'll notice that on the, on the eastern side, which is the southeast where the dunes are, that they were there or they grew up because they were stabilized. Yes, despite the strong northeast trade winds, the sand dunes have stabilized and continue to grow. Now, how is that possible? 
In responding to that question, Major Boyce calls attention to the flora and the fauna. He speaks of the utility of aspects of the flora and tells us how our wisdom folks use that in their days for medicinal purposes. And we have some of the vegetation there, like fat porks and the meho. They have stabilized that area, and they are some 20 to 30 feet in height. On the north and south of the river, which is the right bank if you're going down, because you always take it from where the river is flowing, the right bank and the south bank, they have savannas. These savannas, it should be two of them because the, the river had actually parted them, parted the one, therefore you have two pieces or two areas, and they have tall grasses, sometimes with duckweed and um, daisy carpet. That's a small cover, covering plant, which is found there. And then more often than not, you'll find a mild, what we call a mild tree, or what is called a maple plant. It's, it's actually referred to as a sisal or hemp plant. Now, these plants, for the most part, either, either have medicinal value or they are, were useful in the past, and maybe still is, to the residents in St. Andrew. For example, the maypole was used for, as a flotation device for the fishermen at sea to catch their catch the fish or their sea eggs. And then the stem, which is actually made of water and fiber, those were beaten out. The water, the water would go and it would leave the strand, what we call the fiber. Those were then plaited, and in the old days, when people had problems with buying a rope, then that was plaited and made into a rope, or it could have been made into a mat as well. Now, the spines on the stems were actually cut off, and they were used to hang clothes in the old days. So there were hardly any clothes lines around, and there were hardly any pins around to hold up the clothes, so you would spread the clothes on the sisal of him. To the north of the pond is a favorite nesting site for turtles, the Hawksbill and the Logger Hill, and the Loggerhead, sorry. In past times, there was the green turtle, but I believe that the green, the green turtle became extinct because of the Arawaks. They love the meat, and they also love the shell for making ornaments. And I think in some cases, tools as well. The hawksbill is probably the most common, common, but it is the second most endangered species in the world. They nest every two to three years, chiefly in June and August. And I can remember as a young boy, I used to go into that particular part north south of the, which is north, sorry, north or south, it didn't matter, of the pond. And what would happen is that we would wait for the turtle to come in, which is a bad thing to, to do. And then we would wait until it laid the eggs. And when it laid the eggs, and it, on this way back up, because it came back up the same way it went in, we would dig a hole, and when it get to the hole, it would just drop in the hole, and most it would turn over. And then, sorry, but we then took what we wanted from it and left the rest, shell and all. So that was a bad thing to do. Nowadays, there is a law governing that so that these creatures cannot become extinct. There's also a saying that the penis, <laughs> the penis of the turtles was highly touted as a cure for renal and kidney stones. It was also used for an attack of call it when at, at sea or those returning from England. If you move further south from that position, you're going to come to a wooded area. Now, this wooded area, again, is very important. It has a number of trees which are used for medicinal value, or medicinal, 
miscellaneous purposes. And these are things like the dog dumpling <laughs> or the noonie. To tell you the truth, I don't know if that has any scientific value at all, but it was used, and in America, it was selling for $1.25 for as much as a Coke bottle. I, I, it came probably from Southeast Asia and Polynesia, in those places where they mix it, whatever concoction they made, and then that was sold. Now, there's a the carpet daisy. That, ha that didn't have any medicine value, but it w if the cows eat it, for example, it they would have what is called induced or sp spontaneous abortion. Now, I'm not saying that the girls should go and eat the carpet. I don't know. More work has to be done on that. Then there was the almond, and that almond was used, was deceased, were broken open. I know as a little boy, we would break them open, and then we would eat the nuts. Then there's something called bread and cheese. Now the bread and cheese, the, the seed, it had a seed in the pulp. So we would eat the pulp. And what was very important in those days, the actual vine. It was very, very strong, and it was used by the older folks, especially the men folk, for making dung baskets. Those dung baskets are still around, some are still around, and they were used for heading all sorts of things. I think today now they are used as a kind of display when you have artifacts or art being displayed. Now there was also crab eye seeds. Now crab eye seeds were black and almost like a pill, black and red. No medicinal your value, but to tell you the truth, we used to bite on it when we were getting lashes at school. But a good thing that we didn't bite through that seed because some of those plants on the East Coast Road have poison, ruben or auburn, and probably, God knows, you would have been died already. But they were, they were saying that, you know, that if you eat them, if you bite into them, you won't feel the lash. I felt every lash that I got at school. But there was another purpose to the seeds. The seeds were put in, lamp, in lanterns, the old lamps and lanterns. When the wick got short and it, was, and it was going out, so to speak, what you would do is put the seeds into the lantern or the lamp, and then it would bring the oil level to the wick where you will still get your flame. And that is based on Archimedes' principle. It's like the stork, for example, who found a pitcher and stuck his beacon or billing, and he couldn't get any water, so he decided to go and get some rocks, fill it up, came to the top, and he was able to, to drink the water. Then there's the clammer cherry. Now the clammer cherry tree is a very useful plant because it was used basically for building boats. Apparently what happened here is that the, the wood, the seawater did not affect the wood. And the ribs of the Moses, the boats, even the, um, even the, you call the fish pots, were made out of that climatory tree. And of course, the berries were used back in those days for sticking kites and anything else you had at home because in those days you probably wouldn't get glue or glue would be very expensive so you use your local resources. I ate some of the seeds, they didn't do me anything. And then there's the mansion needle. No specific good purpose, but it was there probably as shade or to hold up the soil. But you had to be careful with the mansion needle because what happened to the mansion needle, it gave it a sap. And if it went on you, then you would be in trouble. But if you know what to do, then you could go and get some white wood. And white wood was the fastest growing tree in that era. Now you have the wild tambourine, which has overtaken that. But you scratch the, the leaves together, and then you apply it on the affected part, and that will soothe it. 
But I've known some people, for example, some of my boys, for example, who got, who got it in their eyes and they had to go to the doctor for medication. Then there is a castor oil and the castor oil seed. The old ladies used to put that in their head when they have had a problem, headache or whatever, but it used to smell real badly. That's the truth. And then the seeds, they would boil the seeds and it would, make it as, it would be used as a, lax, a laxative. But you had to be careful because that seed contained a poison as well. Then there was the white wood that you just spoke about. That probably had one of the best woods around the place. I think when I was at school and I was doing carpentry, what we would do is use the wood with the mahogany. So what you would have is the mahogany and the wood together. And don't care how you shine your mahogany, the white wood still stood out. A very useful plant. And of course the leaves, where you said that they were the, the probably the fastest growing plant is the leaves were spread by the wind. Because they have, they have wings, like the seeds are enclosed in wings and they are scattered by the wind. But the mahogany, somehow, the mahogany just splits open and ejects, ejects the seeds. But of course, they can come by water. Now, nearly all the ridges in the watershed, because Long Pond is found in a watershed. That watershed is known as Long Pond Watershed. So Long Pond is the pond, but then you have the watershed. And the watershed, as you can see from here, are made up basically of ridges. And all the ridges seem to come towards the Bell Plain. Even if the ridge starts north, from south to north, then there would, a branch would probably turn and then it would still come back towards the north. In fact, they seem to parallel the course. I don't know if during the, the, the uplift and the orientation of those that you had them just sticking up out of, out of the soil. Now, there's a funny thing here. The old people, most of the people, sorry, live on these ridges. And the ridges, some of them are tending towards a peak. Some are tending towards a plateau side of level area. And the ones that are especially on the peak, they cause endless erosion. Because of the soil, because of the slope, some of those slopes are 35 degrees. The soil is very poor and infertile. And the, the rainfall causes that. Now, if you look again at the ridges where those houses are, you'll notice that some of the ridges, some of the houses are on one side, the sea towards the sea, especially Saddleback and Chalky Mount. In fact, Chalky Mount is made up of two sets of soil. You get half of it, about half of it, in the sandstones, so you don't get any slippage there. And then when you leave there and you go towards the school, for example, people that live on that side always have problems, not only because of the uncontrollable wastewater coming from their houses, their pig pens, or their roof, actually lubricates the soil. And that soil is part of the Joe's River mud. In fact, the Joe's River mud runs from that area right through Coggins and into White Hill. And that is the problem we have because it is loose, it is unconsolidated, and whenever it is saturated, full of water, added to the fact that is, gravity is acting on it, and then you have the various heavy vehicles going over, vibration sets up waves, and cause it to push out and rotate backwards, so you will also get, as well, slips, slice, and flow in that area. The other areas are, some of them, can stand up once they are covered in some type of vegetation. Now, there are 10 watercourses in Barbados. Well, known watercourses. Long Pond, the Salt Pond, Green Pond, 
Codrington Bath Constitution, the Long Pond watershed is about the third largest. It is it has I think it is the area is about 27.7 square kilometers or about 9.6 miles. And that is a very large area when we think of St. Andrew because if all of the, the ridges and people live there, the, there's only a small portion which is in the area that we are on now, which is part of Belle Plain and Lakes. In fact, if you were to follow the zero contour line from Windy Hill, going through lakes, going towards um, Hopewell, maybe as far as King Garden or Blue Steel, for example, and you take that other route and you come back down, that is, you pass by the, the, the foothills of the, of, um, the high guts and isolation, you come back through Bell Plain at the foothills of Bell Plain, of Ben Hill, you go out into the shore, what you have? Is a lovely plain. So I do not know if they, when they say Bell Plain, if they uh, refer to the whole of this plain. As you can see, it's below sea level too. So God help them if a tidal wave should come. I hope I'm not in this area. I'm very, very sorry, but I hope I'm not in this area. But it goes all the way then, following walkers, the, the foothills around by the church comes back and goes into Greenland and then out and into the shore. All of that is a one plane. And the problem here is that Bell Plain, they give the name to Bell Plain to Bell Plain, but I don't think it was that, that area. That, it was a beautiful plain. That's what Bell Plain means to me. Bell from the French meaning beautiful, and then you have the plain meaning a flat area. But what happened is that Bell Plain could have been named after that hill there, which is the Bell Hill. That plantation was owned by a guy called Bell. So I don't know if he, he just used it to say to name Bell Plain or the whole entire beautiful area. It's probably the flattest real estate in the whole of Barbados. It's very attractive too as well. And if you notice that there's hardly any there's hardly any rocks in this area as well. Because what happened is as the, the valleys came through the, the ridges, because the, the valleys, or the, what do you call gullies? Nobody else calls them but gullies here, right? It was actually a valley at the foot of those ridges, those coalesce to form this flat area. And that flat area we have learned from educator Major Boyce is Bell Plain. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for joining me and special thanks to Major Boyce. The program continues next week at the same time. Goodbye.